good evening. Today we special, uh, we come together in worship in a special way to celebrate Maundy Thursday. Please turn to page 355 in the Book of Common Prayer. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose dear Son on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life, and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from Exodus. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your account for the lamb. And thus you shall eat it. With a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today can be found on page two of your bulletin, Psalm 116. We will read verses one and 10 through 17 responsively. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? 
I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, not, though not all of you. 
for he knew what, who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for this is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now, the Son of Man has been glorified in him, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little while longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I have given you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your holy word in this special night tonight. We ask that you bless your eternal word and continue to bless us as we worship you in spirit and in truth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. This is a very, very, very beautiful scripture. Uh, if you'd like to follow me in your Bible, you may. In John chapter 13, I was looking at this again this morning, and I was just blessed at how great this is. So I'd like us to walk through it. John chapter 13, first verse. Now before the feast of the Passover, so Jesus was there for the Passover feast. This is why he is in Jerusalem at the time, and the Passover is one of the major feasts of Judaism, and there are tremendous, tremendous amount of people there in Jerusalem. They've come from all over. When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world. Now, how would you like to know when you are going to die while you are still alive and the exact way that you're going to die? And you find out that the way you're going to die is about as bad as you could possibly imagine. That the death that you're going to die is going to be excruciatingly painful and is going to take some time. I, it's hard to believe that we have John chapter 13 to 17 and Jesus is so composed. Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Okay? So remember, he comes into the world having created the universe and created every person on the planet Earth. Now remember, he has created the entire universe as we know it. And he has come into the world as the incarnate Son. He is pre-existent, which means he has no beginning and he has no end. The eternal Son of God. To depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now those that were in the world, his disciples, he loved them totally and absolutely. This shows us 
that Jesus has an extraordinary capacity to love people. This is one of the many reasons that he should be the most important person in your life because no one loves you more than Jesus Christ. No one. No one. And his love for you has infinite extent, value, depth, height, and breadth. During supper, when the devil had put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, is the devil real? The devil is so real that he can infiltrate the 12 disciples and Jesus Christ, who had spent three years together, that he could literally destroy them all. Literally destroy them all, which he did. He destroyed all of them over the next several days. The power of Satan, very real. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands. Now, the knowledge of Jesus is extraordinarily great also. And he knew that everything that God had was going to be given to him. This is also indicated in Matthew 28, 17, after Jesus' resurrection. And that he had come from God and was going back to God. The beginning of the relationship that Jesus has with God is not possible to be known since it's eternal. It is impossible for us to conceive that there is actually a relationship that has a beginning, but theirs has no beginning. It has always been present, and there is no beginning to their relationship. But he was going back to God. He rose from supper, he laid aside his garments, he took a towel. This is almost an impossible to believe action on Jesus' part. It's one of the stun most stunning things he ever did. I think probably the most stunning thing he ever did was die on a cross outside of Jerusalem between two thieves, and Barabbas was given up for him and got to go free. And he was treated profoundly unjustly, as we'll see tomorrow. So he takes a towel, which is the lowest of the slaves to do, and he pours water into a basin, and he starts washing the disciples' feet, and he wipes them with a the towel that was wrapped around them. Now, this is the creator of the universe. This is the person that died for your sins. This is the person that loves you more than anybody that you could possibly know in your entire life. Simon, of course, speaks out, as he normally does. Lord, do you wash my feet? What you're going to do, you don't understand, but afterward, you will. So they didn't, at the time, understand what he was doing. And then, of course, he's indignant. You're not going to wash my feet. You, as great as you are, are not going to wash someone as low as I am. If we go all the way back to the beginning of the Gospels, Peter did not want to hang out with Jesus and do what he said uh, initially in terms of the call because he felt so inferior to him. He saw how great Jesus is because of the catch of fish, and he did not believe that he should be in the presence of Jesus. He was definitely not good enough in his mind. If I don't wash you, you shall have no share with me. And, of course, Peter could not imagine that that could happen. So he says, wash always also my hands and my head. Now, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. You are clean, but not every one of you. And what you want to be in your life is you want to be clean before Jesus. Now, without Jesus, you are very much unclean, very much unclean. Before Christ, in repentance and forgiveness, and in his washing away of our sins because of his crucifixion and on the cross and his resurrection, we are made clean. But he says, not every one of you, and of course he's referring to Judas. For he knew what, who was to betray him. Of course he knew that. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. Now, he washes their hand and feet in verse 12. He puts on his outer garments. He resumes his place, and he begins to teach them. This is why it's so important to read the Bible on a daily basis. This is why it's important to read the Bible on the daily basis. You want, I hope, want to hear from, I hope, the most important person that's ever lived that has the words of eternal life. You, I'm guessing, would want to know what he is saying and what he has said and what he is saying to you and me today and every single day of your life until you see him face to face. You would want to know that. And it's written down in a book. All you have to do is open it and read it. 
So now he's going to teach us something that you would have never thought of in your life. You would have never thought of it. So when you don't know this, it doesn't help you. It's not so you're just going to all, all of a sudden get one day, you're going to get a revelation of what he's now getting ready to say. It's not going to happen unless you read it and believe it and act upon it. Okay, here we go. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. That right itself is very, very powerful. That Jesus is our great teacher. So what does the teacher do? The teacher teaches us information. Do you have the information from Jesus Christ on a daily basis? Are you learning from Jesus Christ on a daily basis? Are you listening and reading and studying his word on a daily basis? Second question for all of us, is he your Lord? Is he more important than anyone in your life? Are you submitting to him? Are you putting him first? Are you going to him first every day of your life? Are you doing what he says in terms of obedience? When he tells you to do something because you've heard from him in terms of teaching, you now do it because he is the Lord of your life? That right there, we could stop. You are right, for so I am. If then you, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also wash, need to wash one another. So I'm now extending this and showing you how important it is for you to do what I just did. I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Okay, those are easy words. No big, long words in the sentence. Easily discernible in English. Truly, I truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. So we cannot in any way ever be greater than Jesus. Although it's amazing how often we think we are. It's amazing how often we think we know more than Jesus does. It's amazing how often we say, I don't need to read my Bible. Oh, I don't need to pray. Oh, I don't need to go to church. Oh, I don't need to go to that service. Oh, I don't need to do that. I know that. Really? You do? Really? A servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now, how are you going to do them if you don't know them? It's impossible that you would impossible there's no way that you're going to think of doing this none so this is why we have this holy service because we want to do something that jesus told us to do and that those of us that are here that do this will be blessed now you are all invited to do this you will be blessed if you do and i'm just quoting jesus not quoting myself when he had gone out, now we go to verse 31, if you're following me in your Bible. He says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Now, this is the ultimate goal, that God Almighty is glorified, and Jesus Christ is glorified. Now, the world's going to think that what they are getting ready to do is stupid, is insane, is idiotic, is absurd, is crazy. You're going to die on a cross? You've got the Romans that killed him. You've got all the, the Jewish religion that couldn't stand him, plotted how to kill him, and got it pulled off. And then they turned the people against Jesus. His disciples all fled the scene. Total victory from the other side. Total victory. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Now, in the end, we know that God is ultimately glorified. That's why the judgment is Christ. That's why everything in salvation remind, revolves around Christ. This whole episode in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the passion of Jesus in his resurrection has to do with ultimate salvation being found only in him. That's it. There is no other answer. Little children. Yet, a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, this is Jesus talking. This is not me. I'm just reading from the Bible. It says, verse 34, a new commandment I give you. That, boy, you better get ready for this one, because this is from the creator of the universe. This is where everything, everything in life, everything in history hangs on him. He says, I want you to love one another. Just as I've loved you, you also love, called to love one another. 
it's obvious in our world today there is an extraordinary amount of hate, discrimination, fighting, bickering, violence, death, disaster, separation, segregation, jealousy, envy, and golly, lots of other words that I can think of and you can think of too. Those are all not from the Lord, all of them. Jesus is calling his disciples to love one another and to demonstrate that. Not just to say, I love you, but to demonstrate, I love you. That is from Jesus' mouth himself, and that absolutely is God's will for every person in this church who believes and knows and follows Jesus. You don't have any cho other choices. And any other action that's not like that is not of the Lord. It's as simple as that. And it really doesn't matter what's going on around you, and it doesn't really matter what somebody's done to you. He has this wonderful Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 43 to 48, about loving your enemies. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. He does it first. He shows us the love for the Father. He shows the submission to the Father in obedience by dying on a cross. We are to do the same for Jesus. He shows us that his love for the Father and the Father's love for him is absolute because in the end, he has nothing. And that should be the way you live your life, that your love for Christ is absolute and more important than anything in your life. And Christ's love for you is the greatest love that you could possibly know. And from that relationship and those sets of facts, you are loving every single person in your life, period, no exceptions, and no circumstances that could get you out of that. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How can somebody really tell if you are a Christian person? You have love for other people, particularly your enemies. You have love for people that don't like you, particularly your enemies. You have love for people that won't talk to you, love for people that talk badly about you, love for people that don't care about you, love for people that walk on the other side of the street, love for people that are in your family that do not care for you. I mean, I could go and you could go on and on. Are there any exceptions? Uh, zero. Are there any other ways that we could look at this that we could get off the hook? Uh, zero. And so tonight, is a very important night. Jesus himself in John 13 says, do this and you'll be blessed. I want you to do this. So we are going to offer this to every one of us for as long as it takes. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. We thank you that in the extraordinary way that he handled being with his disciples in the Last Supper and teaching them, knowing that he was going to die on a cross the next day with extraordinary composure and love and peace and joy. We pray that the presence of Christ may touch each and every one of our hearts in such a way that the supernatural love of God given by his mercy and grace to each one of us who call upon the name of the Lord would work through us in, in a way that shows that Jesus is real. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is alive. Jesus is risen. Forgive us of all of our sins, Lord God, and in all the ways that we do not love one another. Infuse us with the power of the Holy Spirit to love one another in this holy church, to love our neighbor, to love those in our community, to love our family members, and to love our enemies. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Reverend Kathy.
now.
prayers for the people. Dana. The prayers of the people, Form 3, can be found on page 387 in the Book of Common Prayer. Form 3, page 387. Let us pray. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our mercy might favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their sex. Give to the departed eternal rest. That light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. And we also want to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others, especially Vivian Minert. Dan Bridgeford, Vicki Chastang, Deacon Bob Johnson, first responders, and the men and women in the military services. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We are so glad that you are here tonight. I want to give a round of applause to our choir and to our vergers who really are blessing us in the service tonight. I've always felt that Maundy Thursday night is an important night, and Reverend Kathy will share about that with us and our, our activities the next couple of days that are so important. It's, you know, I was thinking this morning, early this morning, just kind of trying to get myself in a place where I'm really thinking about Jesus and what he did for me and just kind of focused on the importance of it. It's not easy to do because there's so many distractions. So I will continue to pray for all of us as we work through this Holy Week together. If this might be the first time you're journeying with us on a Monday Thursday, I wanted you to know at the conclusion of the Holy Eucharist service, it just goes right into some musical preparation for stripping of the altar. And we encourage you to just stay in the pews. 
And then at the conclusion of the stripping of the altar, as you see the, the altar party, the vergers and the clergy that will go into St. Mary's Chapel, then you are welcome to adjourn there with us for the one hour watch. For Holy Communion, we offer it in three different ways that you can receive the host and drink from the common cup. And if that's how you'd like to receive, we invite you to come to the right side of the altar. We also offer it by intinction that we will put the host in your hand and then someone will come and dip that in the chalice and serve you. If you'd like to receive that way, please come to the center of the altar. And then if you would like to receive where the wine is already on the wafer and we consecrate that together, and so you don't drink from the chalice, please come to the left side and we will serve you there. Amen. Let us join together in our offertory sentence. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread.
Our service continues on page 372 in the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light, inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day. And beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. We acclaim you, Holy Lord, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help, so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you love the world so much that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, to the sorrowful joy to fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death and rising from the grave destroyed death and made the whole creation new and that we might live no longer for ourselves but for him who died and rose for us. He sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe to complete his work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us, this bread and this cup, we praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, 
sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ, and grant that we may find our inheritance with all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing. the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You may come now to receive the body and blood of our Lord.
Our post-communion prayer can be found on page 366 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you now and always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.
Bless the Lord who forgives our sins. His mercy endures forever. The collect in your bulletin said in unison, O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the late 4th century, about the time the text of the Nicene Creed had been settled, it was the custom of the Jerusalem Church to have a special Holy Eucharist on the Thursday night of Holy Week, marking the Last Supper Jesus had with his disciples. By the 7th century, this practice had been adopted by the Church in Rome. St. Isidore, Archbishop of Seville, who died in 636 A.D., was already speaking of the practice of stripping the altar at the end of the Thursday night Holy Eucharist in Spain. He taught that it was an homage offered to Jesus in response to the humility he showed in washing the disciples' feet. The Christian altar is the center of our Eucharistic worship and sacrifice. In stripping away the altar coverings, we remember how Jesus was also stripped of his garments and left naked in his great act of sacrifice on the cross. No further Eucharist will be celebrated at this altar after tonight until the Holy Eucharist on Saturday afternoon and, of course, our Easter Sunday morning celebrations. The removal of all the linens and ornaments surrounding the altar remind us of the temporary but stark removal of Christ from the lives of his disciples on this night. After the Lord's Supper, less than 24 hours remained in the earthly life of our Lord. As his life was stripped from him, so we strip our altar of the signs of life to symbolize his redemptive suffering and death for us. Plants show us new life springing forth in God's creation. We remove them now to mark the beginning of this night of Christ's suffering. Jesus Christ, God from God, light from light, proclaimed his identity as the light of the world. John wrote, light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because all their deeds were evil. At the death of Christ, the world was plunged into deep darkness. And so we also extinguish our candles and remove them.
God so loved the world that he sent his own son, his gift to us, to redeem us from our darkness. We respond with gifts of our own at our worship services where we gather each week. Now, just as the sacrifices offered in Christ's body was removed from sight and burial, we remove the vessels of our offerings. The Missal Stand holds our book of liturgies, which we follow at every joyful Eucharistic celebrated at this altar. But for these hours of Christ's suffering, our hearts are heavy. As the sounds of joy are removed from our lips, we also remove our book of liturgies and the Missal Stand holding them. Jesus handed bread and wine to his disciples on this night, transforming those creatures forever in the understanding and witness of his followers. This is my body. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, just as Jesus was removed from his disciples, first by being taken into custody of his enemies, and then by having his dead body placed into the grave, so we remove the elements and vessels of this holy sacrament. This holy altar is customarily covered and prepared for the service of Holy Communion 
with the people of God. The covering, coverings are made of fine linen and beautifully embroidered images. The fair linen itself is already marked with five embroidered crosses, reminders of the five wounds on Christ's exposed body. As our king's body was stripped in crucifixion, so our altar is stripped of its garments and left to stand bare. So that the holy altar may bear testimony of the pure offerings of the Lamb without blemish, our clergy scrub and wash the surface. May we never present ourselves for Holy Communion without also asking to be cleansed and washed of our sins, so that we do not eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner after so great a sacrifice.
they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. <laughs> 